Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Weird Web Radio. In this episode, we're going to be talking to Christopher Smith, also known as Mr. Wednesday. He's the author of a book called Icelandic Magic and one of the probably world's leading experts on how to understand all those Icelandic stories and tales. So, Christopher, welcome to the show. Good evening, Lonnie. Good to be here. I vastly appreciate that you've given us your time, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what sort of stories that you're prepared to share with us and insights into not only Icelandic magic, since you are the residing expert on the subject, at least between the two of us, (laughs) and uh, we'll also be digging into some of the ideas of uh, paranormal topics such as ghosts and hauntings and and the undead and any other sort of tales that you are familiar with you from the old Icelandic tales and expose the world to a whole new way, possibly of looking at other ways of seeing the paranormal. And not only that, but maybe even seeing where some of our ideas came from. It should be interesting to see what you teach us. Well, thank you for having me here. Yes. Let's see what we can do. (laughs) Agreed. Together, my friend, we're going to seek these mysteries. So, Right out of the gate, I wanted to talk to you about ancestors. And the reason I bring ancestors up is because I think it's important that we remember our ancestors in our daily lives. And they have a great many lessons to teach us today. And honoring the ancestors is an important part of my own spiritual work. And I believe they may be a part of yours as well. Yes, indeed it is, yes. Right. Now... Who would you say you were closer to uh, between your mother, your father, or your grandparents on either side? Well, um, I I don't think I could really distinguish between my mother and father in terms of closeness. Uh, My mother, unfortunately, is no longer alive. She died about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, My father is still alive and um, getting on quite well for his age. Uh, My Parents both gave me something of a start in terms of my interest in Germanic magic, in that my mother was always interested in the supernatural and the tarot and astrology and the like. And my father was quite interested in the tales such as Beowulf and uh, and the Icelandic tales and uh, all kinds of uh, tales of the past, and he encouraged me to read up on those. So there was something of a, a melding from two different directions, really, which has resulted in me becoming interested in, in Germanic magic. Well, you're lucky to have that such influence at such a, an early age. Uh, my parents weren't too big into anything supernatural, but we heard plenty of ghost stories growing up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you know, you wouldn't say that you were closer to one or the other necessarily. But so, no, no. if you could, if you could choose really one really important lesson that's impacted your life from them, what would it be? From my parents, um, stick at things and learn as much as you ever can. Uh, that's that's the lesson I've got from them. My parents very generously paid for the best education that I could possibly absorb. And, um, you know, that was back in the days when, uh, well, we didn't have student loans then. We did get government grants, but uh, I only got a 50% grant and they had to cough up for the other half of it and um, uh, to keep me at university. And when I was 17 and uh, uh, sort of coming up to doing my A-levels, as we called them, they're, they're exams that you do at school at the age of about 17 or 18 that qualify you for university. And uh, one summer I said to my father, do you know, Dad, I I don't know if I really want to carry on to university. I seem to have been in education for so long. And he encouraged me to go to university, and I had three jolly good years. And um, so 
I went beyond that and tried to do a PhD, but I, that was a bit of a failure because I wasn't really interested in the subject. But he would have been prepared to support me through that if necessary. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the the main thing that I've got from them is is you know just learn and learn and absorb as much as you ever can from everything and keep interested in things. That's an important lesson I think we could all learn from. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing. Now, in the realm of Icelandic or Germanic magic, you said that uh, your mother even had interest in Germanic magic or her influences led you to research it and become part of it. What What is the best way to address that practice? It, does it go under a specific title that you would prefer or is there a lot of terms that always come to mind? Not really. Never... Not really. I, I, I dislike um, fixed nomenclature and putting things in boxes. Um, the, the magic of the North, that's of, of the Germanic countries, by which I include, obviously, uh, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, England, um, and all of Scandinavia and Iceland, um, is rather different from the magic of the of the Mediterranean area of the Western tradition. And um, a lot of it was lost, all the, and uh, we're, we're trying to reconstruct that now um, from the old books, as I've tried to do in my book on Icelandic magic, by taking Icelandic uh, books of magic, Galdrabeker in Icelandic, um, and analyzing them and seeing what they have in common and analyzing the aims to which they were put and the techniques that the sorcerers used and, and what was important to them. Uh, and, and that's what my book is all about. So I, I wouldn't really say that there was um, any fixed term you could use for it, but I, that, I just use the term Germanic magic. Uh, it's a suitable term. And in full disclosure to my audience, I'm also a practitioner of said yeah. Germanic magic. Uh, it's nice to hear someone who's got so much more experience share their thoughts on, on the different aspects and why we should call it this or that. Hmm. Yes. Well, I, I know you're a practitioner, Lonnie. <laughs> so we've been in touch before. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what would you say are some of the choices that made you who you are today in, in terms of uh, Germanic magic? In terms of Germanic magic, um, <clears throat> I think that one of the important choices I made because the warrior ethos is is so strong in Germanic in, in old Germanic society, one of the things that shaped me was uh, uh, joining the territorial army, uh, which is a, a part time military force, uh, rather analogous to your National Guard in the USA, and um, I joined that uh, when I came to university at the age of 18, and I, in due course, became an officer in the Territorial Army. And um, it taught me a lot. It shaped me about um, decisiveness, about uh, staying switched on, as we call it, um, not letting your attention wander, and um, getting things done in a quick and orderly fashion. And really just how to how to lead men how to command and that was one of the first things that was uh, that shaped me uh the other thing that uh, shaped me was the whole process and it was a long one of becoming a heathen and by heathen i distinguished between uh northern uh northern religious practice so of the pre-christian type and pagan, which tends to embrace just about everything else, i.e. worshipping um, the Celtic gods or, um, or, or the Mediterranean gods or the Egyptian gods. And for me, that started off, uh, I think, around about the time I was 21. And I had moved already from becoming a Christian to becoming, mm, I didn't quite know what. 
And after I passed my exams at university and uh, found it after the first <laughs> after the first uh, jubilation, it was a bit of a letdown because I still had all the problems of life to face, and it, it having the university de degree didn't make all that much difference to me. And then I started thinking of things in wider metaphysical terms and questioning what I actually believed. And I thought, well, where do I stand really? And I decided that I believed in the old gods of England and thought about who are those gods? What's, how can I find out more about them? Now, for a period at first, I um, considered myself a Wiccan and uh, right up until about 19, 1988, I ran a, a small Wiccan coven here in the area. Uh, but it became increasingly apparent that uh, my preference went out to the old Norse gods, uh, Woden, uh, Sunur, uh, Tyr, Frey, and the like, and, and the goddesses, of course. And um, I made a pretty much decisive break with Wicca at that point. So that was a that was another decision in a way, but it was a, a decision taken over a period of time. It was a series of decisions. Uh, the other thing that uh, shaped me as well was my decision to become self-employed, because then you're entirely self-reliant. No man is your master. And you stand or fall by the decisions you take, which I, I think really is something I would recommend to everyone. Uh, other things that have affected my life very deeply of the experience of becoming a father. Uh, when I, I was, I became a father when I was already thirty-eight, and it was a wonderful experience that uh, taxes you at times, but it teaches you a great deal of patience and responsibility. And finally, as I grow older now, um, the experience of accepting one's own mortality and immortality and what are you going to do about that? You know, when, when you're young, you think that you're immortal. You know, that's, why, that's why they take young people to be soldiers and why, <laughs> why, why young men ride motorbikes because you, you think it's never going to happen to you. You're immortal. Uh, and of course, as you get older, then you, you become painfully aware of that you've only got so many years left. I hope that I've still got quite a few left, but you never know. I'm 62 now. Yeah. But, well, you and I um, both have that hope. Yes, thank you. <laughs> they're, 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 I mean, those are, the, those are the things that shaped me in general terms. Well, it, it seems as though you had a, a definite journey, some of which echoes many, uh, many of what others experienced going from uh, uh, early Christian life to Wicca and then on to find something more specific that is more fulfilling often times. Now, uh, uh, concerning the immortality of youth, th there, there's a phenomenon here where I've grown up in uh, central Illinois mm -hmm. called car surfing. Have you? <laughs> it's the idea that, yes, it's a, it's a foolish notion that I think evolution came up with to breed or, or to eliminate <laughs> teenagers from the gene pool. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I understand well the foolishness of youth and the immortality that you believe you have shifting into a, it's almost awareness at some point in your late twenties or thirties that you are in fact mortal and, and, Oh, you should not be doing such foolish things. <laughs> now, when you transitioned from Wicca into heathenry, yes, and and clearly stayed within the heathen realm of practice, who were some of your influences that helped you shape your heathen practice and ideas? Without doubt, my major influence um, from the beginning was Edred Thorson. Uh, I. In my practice of Wicca, I had a, a book in which uh, the Saxon Futhark uh, and the Elder Futhark were written in, as an appendix 
but only really as a uh, a sort of secret script um, just for for writing in so that other people wouldn't be able to read it, hopefully. But these characters attracted me and I, they seemed to be calling me and speaking to me and saying, find out more about us, find out more. And so the first thing I picked up from uh, a charity shop, which you would probably call a thrift shop, um, was um, a small book called The Little Book of Runes by the infamous Ralph Bloom. And yes, that was the first one I bought. (laughs) And I picked it up and uh, skipped through it. It didn't take very long, of course. And immediately realized the guy didn't really know what he was talking about and was talking through his hat and making it up as he went along. (laughs) So I gave that one back to the charity shop. And um, then at Yuletide, my parents, having heard about my interest, bought me another book. And um, again, it was a disappointment that uh, I I wrote to the authors and asked a few questions and uh, after the second time I wrote something and they got a little bit snotty about it and um, uh, it, it became apparent they didn't really know what they were talking about either. And uh, nevertheless, I persevered. And then I saw advertised Futhark, a handbook of rune magic by Edward Thorson. And I thought, right, okay, well, we'll try this one then. And it was like a blinding shaft of daylight. At least, uh, uh, at last, I'd found somebody who seemed to know what he was talking about. And, uh, yeah, later on, I I have certain issues with the way that it's written. But, uh, you know, Edred really seemed to know what he was talking about. And he set down uh, a, a concise syllabus of praxis of, of how to use the runes magically and the exercises that you need to do in order to uh, make the runes your own and uh, and make them effective and so and this was years before i joined the rune, rune guild this was back in about 1984 or 5 um, i'd already started uh, the exercises and practicing rune magic And uh, so Edred definitely was a big influence on me and uh, helped me to understand uh, Odin and um, and Thor uh, and and the other gods as um, as magical entities and uh, and 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 their effects on magic that they're not just some viking brawling beer swilling gods you know then they 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 have a very deep metaphysical sense about them and so he was definitely a, a big influence on me uh next of course much later um i joined the rune guild <clears throat> and um i should mention of course th- that i my own magic in by around 2006 had um, pretty much uh, pretty much gone into a bit of a dormant phase. I wasn't really using it a great deal except to protect myself on journeys and to protect the house at night before we went to bed. Uh, then I met uh, a certain character called uh, Damon Licorinos, who's quite a proficient magician in his own right and uh, was uh, he absolutely lives eats breathes and sleeps magic and he got to know me and uh, asked whether i i used magic and i said i did but not very much at that time and uh, he encouraged me uh, to to make more use of it and to make more use of my abilities and so it was that i joined the rune guild and um in the rune guild of course we have a very defined system of learners, fellows, and masters. I prefer the term apprentice rather than learner. It's a bit more old-fashioned and, and, and journeyman instead of fellow, but that's just me. And I was apprenticed to Dave Lee, uh, quite a well-known author of Bright from the Well and the uh, the Wessex series of tales of uh, Road to Thule. 
and and uh, and its successors. And uh, Dave provided me with the feedback that was needed. That was the main thing that I, I really needed was feedback and encouragement. And um, he answered some tricky points for me, helped me to uh, clear up uh, some things on which I uh, I didn't quite see it clearly. And he saw me through to becoming a master in the guild. Then, of course, there's um, Ian Reed. Uh, I, I, I know Ian very well now. And uh, Ian uh, is, is a great musician of the, of the neo-folk variety. And his, uh, his album, Runa, really helped me to, uh, to, to see the runes more clearly, to see another aspect of them than, uh, than Edred gave. He, his, uh, his whole track about the rune staves gives uh, his rune poem, as it were, and, and, uh, and, and, and a very different way of looking at the runes, and very poetic. So, yeah, the, I think another one who influenced me in terms of general magic a great deal is Phil Hine, who's a chaos magician. And uh, his book, Condensed Chaos, greatly influenced the way that I practice. Uh, I consider myself a chaos magician to to some extent, although I'm not a member of the, uh, <clears throat> of the IOT. And... Finally, in terms of <laughs> philosophy in general, I think I have to mention Terry Pratchett, and I, I love Terry, Terry Pratchett's books, and uh, I think you can find so much good philosophy in those uh, put in a very amusing way. Uh, it, it can be dull reading the old philosophers, but, uh, but uh, Terry Pratchett's books give you a laugh at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, Terry Pratchett did have a nice way of bringing a lot of uh, old ideas to a new and humorous life. Exactly. I, I think uh, people who come from a chaos magic background tend to appreciate that a little more than others. It, it's interesting that you, you mentioned that because in my own experience – you know, I, I too came up through chaos magic and into heathenry and then off and then runes. And of course I too am a part of the rune guild. Yes. And, um, I'm also a part of a small group and we're actually, we'll be releasing an anthology soon. Uh, we call ourselves chaos heathens mm -hmm. and uh, a gentleman named, uh, Henry Lauer, uh, is the one who started this movement from the website, lhasablaze.com. Oh, and right. it's the idea that it's the idea that we are chaos magicians who found our spiritual home within the harbors of heathenry, mm. and uh, it, it was the first time that I found my own philosophy in t in tune and in touch with a, a realm of heathenry that existed in all the various ways that you can be heathen out there, and ultimately it did lead me to the guild. So uh, your your journey is is interesting in the way that it led you there, and I. I find it fascinating that I had, albeit small ones, but parallels to your journey. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so in all this work of the the runes and, and studying first Edred's material and then going on to work with Dave Lee and then Ian, uh, how did you find yourself attracted to Icelandic magic? It started really when um, I attended a, uh, a conference of the Viking Society for Northern Research, and <clears throat> one of the speakers quoted something in Old Norse, and I didn't understand a word of it, and I looked around, and everybody was, <laughs> even before it had translated it into English, was nodding wisely and, and smiling, and I thought, gosh... I must be the only people, only person in this theatre who doesn't understand Old Norse. I was wrong, of course, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought I'd better rectify that. And um, then, uh, of course, you've got the aspect of uh, translations of the Edda, uh, the poetic Edda. No two are alike, are they? You know, you um, you, you read. Um, 
the uh, one version of the Edda and it'll be different to a different translation and you have to read several maybe to get the full sense of it. So in some ways I wanted to learn enough Old Norse to go back to the sources. Now Icelandic has changed somewhat over the past 1,000 years, but um, if you can learn modern Icelandic, it's it's a good way to get a grip on the Old Norse, a very good start. So in 2008, I decided I was going to go to Iceland just for an initial exploration and uh, and go over there just for a short while. So I went on a trip which took me two weeks in total and um, I, uh, I I wanted to go by sea. <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> land. I didn't want to land in uh, Reykjavik by air. That would have spoiled it. So I, I, I wanted to arrive by sea. Now to do that, I had to fly up to Bergen in Norway and get on the boat on the on the ferry and uh, sail across via the uh, Faroe Islands where we stopped for one day and then on to Sæðisfjörður in in Iceland and uh, I'd I was in a funny sort of mood at the time I I, <laughs> I hadn't uh, made any plans to go anywhere definitely I, I just sort of put myself in the hands of all father and thought let's happen what happens I, I, i'm going to leave it to you boss and it, i was in a very sort of nihilistic mood and um I, the first thing that happened was i met somebody at the harbor and he was looking for the harbor entrance and he said um i said do you mind if i hop in with you and he, he had a car and he said yes certainly and i said my name's my name's chris uh, what's yours he said Thor. <laughs> His name was Thor. But um, so we we shared a cabin on the boat. But uh, unfortunately, Thor wasn't a good sailor, unlike his divine namesake. And um, he, he was sick for most of the journey because the crossing was rather rough. And I was okay. And um, then uh, there was another incident where I was at the bar having a very expensive pint of lager, cost me about seven pounds. And an elderly Icelandic gentleman said to me, "Where are, uh, what is your name? And I didn't really want to give my name to all and sundry. I, I wanted to get away from everyday life. And uh, now one of my friends, Damon, I've already mentioned, had uh, for a laugh had called me, Mr. Wednesday, because I reminded him of the character in uh, Neil Gaiman's book, American Gods. And uh, so I said, my name's Wednesday, thinking that it would translate to something like Odinsdagur in, in Icelandic, which was a complete flop because it, it translates <laughs> in modern Icelandic as midweek day, which are like German Mittwoch, Mittwikudagur, which um, it just escaped them completely. But I, he asked me where I was from and where I was going and I, what I wanted to see in Iceland. And I, I said, I haven't made my mind up. Well, he said, you must want to go and see something. I said, well, if, I, if I'm pressed, there's a museum in a place called Holmavik, and I'd like to see it. But I'm not even sure that it'll be open. Holmavik, but that's just a little fishing village. Uh, why do you want to go there? I said, well, I have my reasons. And the word went around the the ship, I was the only Englishman on there, that there was this mad Englishman named Wednesday who <laughs> only wanted to go to this tiny place called Holmovic to see a museum. And the midnight, at midnight, just before we landed the next morning, um, I was sitting with the Icelanders and listening to the cadence of their language. I couldn't understand anything, of course, at that stage. I, But I, I just listened to try and get the rhythm of it. And somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And I said, yes. He said, excuse me, are you the Englishman called Wednesday? I said, yes. He said, and you want to go to a place called Holmovik? And I said, yes. 
and he grinned and he said, oh, and uh, by the way, <laughs> he's only got one eye. <laughs> the other eye, the other eye is a glass one. <laughs> and, Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said, um, he said, my wife and I are from Holmovik. He said, I know, and I know the museum of which you speak, which is, of course, the Museum of Icelandic Witchcraft and Sorcery. And he said, how are you proposing to get there? I said, I don't know. I said, I'll catch a bus or thumb a lift or walk if I have to. He said, would you like to come with us in our uh, residential vehicle? He said, which, by the way, is called Askur Yggdrasils, <laughs> the Ash Yggdrasil. Mm -hmm. And I just looked up, you know, upwards, and I just said, thank you, boss. <laughs> so I got a lift all the way to Holmovik, and um, I stayed two nights with those people. One night they introduced me to some other people in Akureyri, and then we stayed a night with them in Holmovik, and after that I went on to Reykjavik. Um, but this, I, he said, will you be coming back? And I said, I think so. And so two years later, I was back there, and this time I stayed for eight months. Um, being a freelance translator, I can carry my work around with me. And uh, and I stayed there for eight months to make a serious effort at learning the language. Wow, that is a, yeah. that's quite a journey. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like Wednesday met Wednesday. In a way, yes. Well, uh, I mean, and you, you asked um, why Icelandic magic. Well, of course, I... I I was in Holmovik and I uh, got to know Sigi Atlason, the curator of the museum, and uh, volunteered my services in the museum. And so I would, he gave me an office and I would sit translating. And then when somebody came to the desk, I would take their money and give issue the tickets and um, uh, and and off they'd go to have a look around the museum. And I of course had free access to a lot of the stuff in the museum and uh, uh, Siggy helped me wherever he could and uh, and that was how I came to write uh, my first work on Icelandic magic which was published in a collection called Occult Traditions so yeah and then uh, from there I went on to collect more grimoires uh, more books of magic from the uh, the archived sources at the Icelandic uh, National National Library, which are online, of course, and uh, and then looked at those until I got um, six works in total that I could refer to, and that's where my uh, my masterpiece started out. Yeah. And so that was the interest in Icelandic magic. You know, I, I've just find it fascinating. So, in the process of accessing all the material in the museum and having access to the different grimoires as you went along, uh, you're learning the language, you're making local contacts, and you're in a wonderful historic place that's tied to the very notion of heathenry itself. And a lot of the, myth, a lot of the myths and the tales, of course, that we have come to us because Icelanders were the ones who wrote them down. Yes. Uh, so, I mean... Icelandic magic as a field of study and translations probably uh, fairly thin. If I if I were to venture a guess, what makes you different from the others who are working in the field? Um, well, I'm, my Icelandic is uh, far from perfect. I mean, it's very basic, really. By the time that I was leaving Iceland after that eight months there, I could um, I could hold a basic conversation. But at least it enables me to look at an original book of magic and uh, and and to read the original Icelandic and uh, and understand it. Um, for example, with the uh, the Hult uh, manuscript, which is in the Icelandic National Library, uh, I was able to translate this on my own uh, with a little help from my Icelandic friends, of course. For uh, for uh, if I was stumbling over something i could ask them and um and even uh i was even able to uh decrypt some of the codes that were used in, in the book or all of it really uh, uh because some of the spells are written in a in a code and uh 
with a little bit of inspiration from all father and, uh, and and my own now so i was able to decrypt those and uh, and and write them down in, in in plain icelandic and translate them into plain english so i think that the, a knowledge of the language is uh, definitely an advantage um Reading things from uh, a heathen perspective is, is is another advantage, although at first I did let it blind me a little bit and I wasn't so um, responsive or sensitive to those operations of magic described in the grimoires, which have a purely Christian content. And um, so now I... You know, I, I take the point of view. It's all magic. It doesn't matter whether it's heathen or Christian or, or whatever. It's it's magic, and we'll see if it works. Uh, and also, uh, I'm a, I'm a practical magician. I'm willing to give things a try. I don't just uh, look at it and study it from an academic point of view. I I, I look at it and think to myself. Can this possibly work? And if I think it could possibly work, then I'm prepared to give it a try. As long as it generally, I don't go around harming people because some of those spells are a bit nasty. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Is it, so as a practical magician, a magician needs their tools. What would we find in an Icelandic magician's toolbox? I think you'd find all kinds of interesting things and, um, most of them would look quite ordinary at first glance because um, Iceland was a desperately poor country in the uh, early modern period, by which I mean 1500 to 1900 in, in Iceland's case. I mean, one author is on, on Icelandic history has said that Iceland didn't really come out of the Middle Ages until the telegraph was established in about 1900. Um so you would find um, uh, perhaps, well, uh, the, the magician very often in order to score the runes or uh, what we call galdrastavir, which are um, magic staves or uh, like rather like sigils, um, they would often use their own eating knife, the, the knife that they customarily carried with them in order to cut up their food and do any other tasks with and you know you establish a psychic bond with that knife and probably allow no one else to use it you wouldn't just hand it over to anyone else willy-nilly then there would be special things i mean there are um cases where uh, a, an awl uh, uh, or bodkin made of silver is prescribed and uh, that would be rather more expensive and rare uh, but you would also find bits of baleen from a whale you know the, the the stuff that a whale uses to filter its food um, and uh, that would not be so uncommon in iceland because now and again whales did wash up on the beach and uh, and were butchered and uh, the food was used and the bones and anything else that they could make use of and the oil of course uh, but the baleen uh, the uh, what whales have instead of teeth um, that that was used for some of the spells um, you might find uh, the uh, feathers from certain birds and uh, it, some of the things I've read may lead me to wonder whether uh, they collected the feathers from certain birds, such as the raven with its association with Odin and the heron which is, with its association with Frigg and so on, or the hawk with its association with Freya. Uh, it's various uh, things, perhaps a, a, a single silver coin used for scoring the runes if they wanted it uh, specifically to be silver that you used pieces of bark pieces of thorn uh, let me think uh, I did write a list here for you um, <laughs> yes uh, yeah pieces of metal to scribe on bits of lead brass silver etc bone sometimes human um it seems that in uh, some cases they weren't averse to digging up the bones of a human being in order to uh, 
in order to cast their spells uh, using, for example, a sharpened toe bone or um, uh, uh, inscribing runes on the uh, on, on the dome of a skull and then sleeping on it in order to get um, in order to get visions in dreams, and quite indispensable, of course. Um, for scrying, for, for knowing um, what other people were doing or to find out the identity of a thief, you would get a, a wooden bowl, which had not been used for any other purpose, and score certain staves on the bottom of it, pour water from a spring into it, maybe a scattering of yarrow on the top of, of, of crushed yarrow, and then look into it uh, in order to identify who the thief had been. Uh, later on, as, as time progressed, um, quills, ink, and parchments tended to, uh, uh, to supersede carving on surfaces with a, with a knife, and, and they would write things down instead. So obviously... Um, Feather quills, uh, ink and parchment, perhaps a little chalk if, uh, for one spell that you would um, write a, uh, a magical stave over the doorway of your house. There's one spell which um, is, a, is a, another thief catcher, and uh, that requires um, something r much more elaborate. It's, it's got to be a... A copper hammer, which has been made from the copper of a bell, which was stolen between the masses, and um, and then it was cast on a certain day, and um, then you uh, would draw <clears throat> an image of of Thor's head with the eye, and uh, and then or the eyes, and then you would drive a copper nail into one eye. And working through Thor, you would then get at Thor, at the thief because Thor, in order to avoid the pain, would go and take it out on the thief. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a remarkably um, roundabout way of working, uh, but that's what they did. And then, if if the really if the thief, and it was supposed to blind the thief in the eye as well, and if the thief still didn't respond, you drove a nail into the other eye and blinded him completely. Yeah. Pieces well, it, of wood from various me, trees. Yeah. Yeah, it mm. sounds to me as if Carry the on. Icelandic magicians were definitely practical in products of their environment. Not to mention bold and brave souls to think that blinding Thor would be a great idea to mm. enlist his help. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can't quite work that one out myself. I, I, I think I, um, I, I wouldn't like to um, get on Thor's wrong side. Um, I, I, I like to think that I've got a rather better relationship with him than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I prefer Thor to be my friend rather than my uh, spiteful enemy. We're quite, agreement quite. on that. Yes. Uh, well, in, in a. In a field of magic, in a culture that finds itself using human skulls and human bones and everything else from their environment to achieve ends and results, what could we consider or was there something considered controversial about the practice of Icelandic magic? Oh, everything was controversial about it. Um, I mean, it, it was um, – it was – never accepted by the Christian church. Um, and remember that Iceland went officially Christian uh, in the year 1000 under uh, great pressure, it has to be said, uh, from Olav Tryggvason, the king of Norway, who was um, threatening to invade the countries and had already had uh, economic embargoes on heathens from Iceland. Uh, so they became Christian, and um, the Christian Church um, has never accepted the practice of, of sorcery. Uh, it was rather two different situations. Up until um, 1550, Iceland was a Catholic country, and the Catholic Church and its doctrine said that um, the, the practice of magic was 
quite simply nonsense. It, it didn't work. It couldn't work. Um, and and they, although it was prescribed, the Catholic Church didn't really make um, much a, of a deal of, of persecuting magicians. Uh, it, they were more concerned with um, with heretics, and there were, I think, up until. 1550, there were only about uh, two people put to death, uh, and, and that was for heresy rather than for use of magic. When Iceland had become Protestant, after a, a bit of a civil war, it has to be said, in 1550, under pressure from the then ruling king of Denmark, and that uh, it was a whole different kettle of fish you know everything was much more straight laced and the the fashion for persecution of witchcraft had come to iceland too as it had already in germany and england and uh norway and sweden and denmark and um so everything was controversial about practicing magic and uh, you you could actually be um uh, accused of witchcraft simply for having a piece of wood on it with some unidentifiable scratch marks that uh, that that made you immediately suspect. So yeah, they had to be very secretive about it. Uh, so yeah, that, that was controversial. Um, also, uh, in, in my book, I make distinctions between. Um, beneficent and malefic spells and neutral spells and um you know some of them were malefic or malign in uh, in in my terms for example what are commonly called um love spells they weren't love spells at all they were date rate date rape spells you know they they, they were ways to get your evil and wicked way with some poor innocent girl and um uh, you know sort of not so much make well she might fall in love with you but the idea basically was just to screw her and um and have done uh which isn't very nice at all because you're, then you're messing with somebody else's free will um and th there are others uh to kill a neighbor's sheep or to make a man fall off his horse while riding so you know the horse would stumble uh you'd, you'd trace the the stave on the horse's hind quarter the horse would stumble on its way through the rider and he'd presumably break his neck uh so i think that's pretty controversial um the, 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 some of the spells are pretty nasty in that respect yeah one uh listener wrote in knowing that i was going to be talking to someone about icelandic mm -hmm. magic about what has been often referred to i believe in that museum that you uh were in for eight months as necro pants. <laughs> yeah. it, <laughs> I, was, I was wondering when they'd come up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the necro pants anyway. So are, is necro pants the proper term for these? And could, if, if you could, could you describe what they are and what they might have been used for? Well, the Icelandic term is Norbrook, which is corpse bridges. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I, even today, I still have a, uh, one of the postcards from the museum with a picture of this item standing on my bookshelf. And, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time in close proximity to the necropants where display when I was at the museum. Um, the, I, I'll, I'll for, for the sake of your listeners, I'll say what it was really all about. The story goes that uh, the trick was to contract with someone who was uh, you know, maybe close to his natural death in any case um, to say, that, hey, after you've died, uh, can I do this? I want to flay the lower part of your body from the waist down. I want to take all the skin off that and make a pair of britches out of it. And... Assuming that you know the, the guy who um, you know said yeah yeah fine you know you do what you like after I'm dead you know which I, I find unlikely in the first place but um, yeah you had to um, get the corpse and take your knife and peel it all off in one piece including the genitals 
including these, his, his, his cock and his balls, you know, and, and the scrotum. And you peel it all off in one piece with no holes in it, no tears in it, right down to the toes. And you peel it all off, you know, like peeling off a pair of trousers from the guy. And then you had to put them on yourself, at which point... <laughs> oh, boy. At which point it said they would cleave to the body, you know, them, and uh, you wouldn't be able to take them off again. And then you had to steal a coin from a poor widow and put it in the scrotum part of the uh, of the corpse breeches of, of of the necropants and. Always and, and use it as a purse, and no matter how often you spent that coin, it would always be replaced, and you would never be without money. And that was the idea. Well, oh, and then the, the, finally, before you died, um, you would have to pass on the corpse breeches to someone else; otherwise, you would be subject to the torments of hell. And um, well, to be honest, I find it all so <laughs> far fetched. You know, I, I can't attach any credulity to it at all. You know, it, it's just—I mean, it's so much hard work. And the, and the idea that you know—I mean, I've—I I was once um, a chiropodist, and I once had the opportunity to uh, do a partial dissection of a of a human leg. Um, and the idea that you can peel off the entire skin in one piece without a single hole or tear, and um, and, and then you know the effort of going around of finding a, a a poor widow who's got a coin and then stealing that coin from her and then putting it in the scrotum just so as you can have a coin all the time, you know. For heaven's sake, go out and get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking there's a there there's a lot of ways to avoid work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and someone and, uh, came up with the, the most difficult means by which <laughs> to yeah. do so. But you know, the the Icelanders are half Irish. <laughs> you gotta <to> remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that that explains everything, right? <laughs> well, the, uh, the, they they love tall stories, as the Irish do, and you know they, they you know they, they love to tell a tall story and see how you'll swallow it. I mean, the uh, Busey, the guy who rescued me on the boat and gave me the lift to Holmavik, and he's become a great friend since. And he loves to tell a tall story, and then you know if you. If you swallow it, he'll he'll laugh mischievously, and um, and, and they are a bit like that. So I think it was all just a tall story, you know. Told it, it's in they call them the um, lapish breaches, you know, associated with the um, the, the Salmi, the, the the laps of Iceland of of uh, Finland, sorry, or northern Scandinavia, anyway. Uh, but uh, and the laps were held to be great sorcerers and. Um, it's, it's in Jorn Arneson's collection of uh, folk tales, which um, uh, Jorn Arneson uh, put together by about 1861. Very famous book. And uh, it's in there, but um, I, th I think it's complete nonsense myself. Yeah, it, it is a little peculiar, though, that such a thing has survived to this very day. I, I wonder what the story was or the the experience might have been when they were discovered and how that discussion came about. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, they, you know, I, I perhaps shouldn't say so, but I think most people of any intelligence realize that the ones in the museum aren't, aren't you know, it's not, it's not real skin. Uh, that's as far as I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. I hate to disappoint everyone out there who were yeah. hoping, uh, yeah. but I assure you there's therapy out there for your desire for real necro pants, or as you call them, corp <laughs> corpse bridges. Yeah, corpse well, bridges. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and maybe. anyone out there doing pirate-themed uh, rock music, I 
I think Corpse Bridges <laughs> would be a perfect name for your band. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this kind of gives us a bridge from the idea of Icelandic magic into something a little bit more supernatural and uh, commonly held paranormal ideas. Uh, the, the Northern scholar, Alice Davidson, once said that the mound – which may be the abode of the dead and the home of supernatural beings is the spot where communication may be established with men. Mm -hmm. And that lends the idea that not only would it be possible to communicate with the dead in some way, mm -hmm. uh, it also gives uh, some similarities to visiting graves today in the cemetery. When we go to visit the, the loss of our, our lost loved ones and yes. we hang around and speak to them as though they could hear us. What sort of views of the afterlife did Icelanders have? Mm, well, that's a big question because it rather depends on which era you're talking about. I mean, it's um, the Icelanders in the what we commonly call the Viking Age or the Icelanders in the 16th, 17th century. I mean, it, it was a big transition. Uh, and, and, and as Ellis Davison himself said, there's um, – uh, the ways of interment and the ways that um, uh, Scandinavians viewed the dead varied enormously over the centuries. I mean, uh, from uh, the rites and customs of uh, sometimes it was uh, burial in mounds and sometimes it was cremation. Sometimes it, they just uh, buried them in the ground without a, a mound. Um, the people in... Uh, in the heathen period up to 1000, uh, they had various ways of looking at it, I think. Uh, according to uh, Snorri, Snorri Sturluson, um, the, the warrior believed that if you fell in battle, um, then you, you went straight, you were picked up by the Valkyra and, uh, and went straight up to uh, Valhall. And uh, where you would feast forever and uh, uh, join with the with your warrior companions and and with Odin uh, in in Valhalla and uh, and have battles every morning and then everybody would be miraculous excuse me miraculously healed and uh, and then they'd all drink together and uh, and sing together in the evening. Uh, that's that's one sort of afterlife. Uh, but for the common people uh well there, there were various halls um some said that um there were halls where uh, faithful and loving married couples would go together in the afterlife but most people believe that they went to hell h-e-l um which was uh i think it, i think overstated as a, as a horrible place by snorri you have to remember that snorri was a christian um I think it's uh, the concept of a um, a, play, a sleepy underground realm, uh, uh, not a place of punishment, just a sleepy underground realm where the dead resided. And sometimes uh, there there is evidence that people believed that uh, if you were prominent enough to have your own how your own burial mound that the, the dead person actually resided within that. And that's why they used to put grave goods with them, you know, all the things that they would need in the afterlife, you know, their spear, their shield, their uh, eating tools. Uh, they would, you know, leave their, they would slaughter their favorite horse or dog and put it in with them. Uh, so there was a very real sense that, um, that the dead person resided there. And there is also a connection with the gods. Um, for example, in, in uh, Gisla saga, the, the saga of Gisli, who was a famous outlaw, um, Thorgrim, I think it was, he, he died uh, or was killed, and they raised a mound over him. And Thorgrim in life had been so devoted to the god Frey um, that always on the southwest side of the mound, which was um, uh, clearly there's a connection with Frey there. Um, it said that it, the snow would never settle 
it was always green on that side of the mound, even in the, even in midwinter. There was never any frost or snow there. And it was said that uh, Frey was so fond of his worshipper that um, he never wanted any frost or ice to come between them. So even apparently uh, Frey lives in the southwest and uh, and he has some say over the weather that he, he can stop the snow and ice settling there and that uh, he also believes that his uh, protege is still living there in the howl. So yes, I think that people did go to the howls and, uh, and and burial mounds in order to talk with their ancestors. Uh, as you say, people still do today. And um, it's, it, it's an enduring belief that, uh, you know, we want to communicate with, with our ancestors, with the dead, and, uh, and get advice from them. You see this especially in um, uh, African countries that have been Christianized now and uh, people I've seen uh, a film of very elaborate visits where they will bring food and drink and, uh, and, and and tell their dead father or grandfather about everything that's going on in the family and uh, and ask advice and ask for intervention and uh, the, the, yes this is still done today I hope does that answer your question yeah yes that <clears throat> that does answer the question very well. It, it it shows the various ways that, I mean, as you said, there were different ways that they would handle bodies, and, and whether it would be from cremation or entering into the ground. And, mm -hmm. and going to the mounds often reflected a, a practice of leaving goods behind, offerings even, hoping for good seasons, good weather, good yes. health, good wishes, and and – uh, I, I know me personally, I've always taken this idea that I, I don't know, I can't speak for their, their own mind. But for me, when I go to visit my own ancestors where they lay to rest, mm -hmm. the idea that I'm communicating with them, I feel, you know, it's, it, it's something that's there that's tied to them. Uh, yes. Physical remains of some kind are there definitely that were tied to their place here on earth. But I don't believe that they're there necessarily. I think it's just it is maybe it's a conduit by which we can reach them. Mm. I suppose someday we're all going to find out one way or the other for sure. sure. And until then, yes. it's just another mystery. Well, I mean, uh, when uh, my um, uh, when my late wife died of cancer, um, what uh, it'll be four years ago uh, this year, and. Um, she wanted to be cremated, as as, as I, I shall duly wish to be in you know in due course. May it be a long time yet. Um, but um, I wanted a suitable memorial for her, and uh, the trouble is with um, you know cemetery memorials. You, you don't really have them uh, forever. You you only rent them, and then uh, you have to keep paying fees for them. And when uh, when nobody else, it gets to a situation when nobody else is coming to see them, oh, they, they'll dig up those memorials and sling them to one side and put somebody else's there. And that all seemed rather too impermanent for me. Um, and then I considered um, planting a tree. Uh, but of course, trees don't last forever. Uh, I thought, right, okay, what does last forever? What would be a permanent memorial? Um, and something which um, not only I can visit, but my children can visit, uh, and also my wife's Dutch family across the North Sea there can also visit. Now, Tineke was um, a great water baby. I mean, she, she, she loved swimming and uh, uh if she would hear a piece of music and I'd say, what does this remind you of? And, and she'd always say for some reason, a river. So she, she had a great affinity with water. And, um, so what we did, uh, the children and I, we went to, uh, the coast, the East coast of England. And, um, we deposited her ashes in the sea there. And, uh, you know, with a prayer that she might, you know, in a sense, become part of the water cycle. Uh, and with the water cycle, uh, you know, she becomes ubiquitous and uh, will eventually be in every pond, stream, and river 
uh, and the sea. So wherever we want, whenever we want to communicate with her, all we need to do is find a body of water. So I suppose she's an und Undine now or a, a Nix. <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful way to honor someone yeah yeah that, that is definitely a beautiful way to honor someone thank you very much for sharing that personal uh you're welcome yeah insight. yes uh now would you say that uh that the icelanders believe in uh haunting or there's evidence that they were visited upon by ghosts oh yes <laughs> Yes, it's, the folk tales are full of it. Um, absolutely, uh, many of the folk tales refer to uh, hauntings right from the, the saga times. Of, um, uh, for example, Grettir the Strong, uh, he famously uh, fought against uh, a, a drog or ghosts called Glam, um, and uh, and defeated him. I have to tell you that in, in our modern society, we and, and especially under the influence of uh, 19th century Victorian ghost stories, we tend to think of ghosts as something flitting and insubstantial. You know what I mean? They, they can walk through walls. Um, they uh, you know, appear like a, a white sheet. Um, and uh, most of the harm that they can inflict is simply the terror of their presence. Well, this is, it was quite different for the Icelanders. Um, and the Draugr is, um, is, is quite a different uh, kettle of fish, really. The, the Draugr, which is often translated as ghost, is actually more akin to a zombie. Um, it has a physical, uh, physical being, and you know they they can be raised by a magician by certain rites, uh, or sometimes they seem to be occupied by uh, by some kind of demon, or they may have been uh, a very strong or bad character in their in their own life. And, uh, and and simply carry on walking about. But they do physically come up out, out of their graves in the story, and they have a very physical presence, and they're half as strong again as ever they were in uh, as a living person. And also the idea is that uh, the older they were when they died, the stronger the drog will be. Uh, so yeah, th that's why you get Glam in Gretia's saga. He's going around and tearing the thatch, uh, you know, the turf off the roofs, and, and and generally violently making a nuisance of himself, which you know is is actually the sign of a very strong um, undead person. Yeah, but that's what we're talking about, really, the undead rather than a rather than just a, a ghost or spirit. The stories are full of them. Would there, and, mm. uh, would there be a specific way that, uh, you know, how would you rid yourself of one of those problems? Well, as it happens, I've got um, one of the things in, in my book, which is um, uh, a spell written in alliterative – Icelandic, so it's it's very poetic, and the translation doesn't really do it justice. Um, but it's an incantation to banish a ghost. Um, uh, I'll I'll read the Icelandic first because I think it's quite beautiful. Um, it says, "Meinarhu morðing." Oh, sorry, I haven't got my clackers in right. Meinarhu morðing in mér nokkurt granda. Frá guðhí ég sveja þér ofan til því anda. Þar kvalli nær þér mest þúsund netta sníður. Í helvítið heitt of breitt halda þér níður. Which means, do you, murderer, intend to kill me? From God I damn you down to the devil. May the torture there, you maker of a thousand nets, in a hot and wide hell hold you down. That's just one of the verses from it. It's quite a long um, 
incantation against uh, against the haunting Droger, and um, yeah, that, so yeah, they could be dispelled by the right kind of magic. Um, other ways were to simply wrestle with them and beat them at their own game. You know, overpower them physically. Um, some spirits, so or, or ghosts, could be tricked into acquiring another form, and then you could trick them into going to, into some kind of hollow vessel, and then you'd stopper it and uh, and then bury that, uh, bur- bury the vessel in which they were uh, stoppered. Or um, if you thought you knew who it was, then you could. Um, wait until sunrise and follow them back to their grave and then you'd roll a huge stone over the grave so that they couldn't get out again um uh Gretir, having overpowered glam then cut off his head and burned him um so obviously it was a very he, he was an undead a walking corpse um let me see oh another way um one way of making uh, or, or of sending uh, a droger uh, against somebody, or a, the, the, I mean, it wasn't exclusively the walking on dead. There was a sort of, um, you know, a spirit presence as well. Sometimes the sorcerer needed a piece of human bone, uh, and they could use it magically to raise the spirit and send it against somebody, which is what they called a sending. And then if you could find that piece of bone and stick a knife in it, that, that would end it all. That would stop the haunting. Yeah. So various methods, but um, I, I mainly discuss the, um, the the magical methods in my book. Uh, those are, <laughs> those are simple, uh, obviously some tricky ways to do it. I wouldn't want to have to wrestle a corpse <laughs> that was fighting back. <laughs> and oh. – and, uh, I couldn't imagine Amazing. how difficult it would be to locate a specific bone and stick a knife in it. Uh, sure. Talk about uh, very challenging tasks. Well, yes, and, 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 and raising them was even worse in a way because what you would do there was um, you had to carve a certain stave on, on a piece of wood and put it on, on the grave. Then you would perform an incantation and the corpse would start to rise out of its grave. And then you would have to wipe, what, or, sorry, lick the corpse froth from its mouth, you know, this sort of foaming, snotty froth which would arise from its mouth. You had to lick that off. Oh, <laughs> then, yeah. Good, good, isn't it? Yeah. And then um, it gets yeah. better. And, <laughs> and then you're advised to um, ask the corpse a maximum of two questions. If you ask three, they would immediately dive back into their graves because they were frightened of the Holy Trinity. So just two questions. And you could ask them who they were, what their name was, and how old they had been when they died. And it was said, like, if they, if they were older than 30, don't bo- even bother. They're going to be too strong. Um, so you have to pick someone, you know, sort of preferably 20 or under, you know, uh, the corpse of a young child was, was, you know, quite useful really, because then you have to, once the corpse halfway out of the, um, of the grave, you have to wrestle with it and force it to submit to your will. And once it's, you know, acceded to your will, then you can send it anywhere you like. So the best thing they said was to wrestle with it before it was fully out of its grave, you know, while you'd still got the advantage. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I can't see me doing that. (laughs) No, 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 I don't think I'll be out looking (laughs) for, I think, again, I think there are far better ways (laughs) to Uh, acquire information or, or, or find help for whatever it is I would need. Yes. One of those beasts yeah uh, exactly so yeah. <laughs> aside from the undead or even the possible uh, disembodied spirits of icelandic lore 
Uh, what are a couple other beings of the other world that we might encounter in those stories? Well, there's um, there are the elves or hidden folk, of course, and um, the, the was widespread belief in in the in the hidden folk who are said to be you know pretty much as we are but they live in something of a different dimension so they're not visible to us and they they abide in the in the rocks uh of 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 iceland iceland is rather a treeless place um and there's, there's quite a big program going on to reforest it but um it was you know, it had already started becoming treeless by the uh, what we call the early Middle Ages, you know, around about 1400. Uh, so the elves mainly uh, live in landscape features. Uh, oh, and, and maybe in ponds um, uh, in, in, in the landscape or in, in certain big rocks, which are said to be their homes, and they only look like rocks to our eyes. Uh, so yeah, you've got the the elves, the hidden folk, and then they can they can be a bit of a nuisance sometimes if you cross them. Uh, they you know if if you upset them, uh, they, they don't like you to see them without their permission. And um, but for the most part, they they also give benefit in a lot of ways. Then there are trolls, and trolls are big and ugly. And, um, you know, they're, uh, well, pretty much as, uh, as Tolkien pictured them in his stories, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, uh, big, brutal, um, and they can't abide the, uh, the sound of church bells and they prefer to live well away from humans. And uh, basically, you better not meet one because the, <laughs> you will meet your death if you're not careful or uh, one story that i was told um the troll women uh they sometimes like to mate with human males but you know they'll once they've overpowered you and got your trousers off and then they say um well you're you're not very big are you you know that's not going to be uh, big enough for me and then so they'll stretch you <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Let's see how much they can stretch you to make it bigger. You see, so uh, we, that, I think that's I think that's probably the Icelanders telling tall tales again. <laughs> yeah, that's, again, um, another good way yeah. to meet your death. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a good way, no. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so there are trolls. Then there are the. Um, other fantastic beasts. Um, there's the uh, sea cows, which are the um, the cows of the um, uh, the mermen or merfolk. Uh, you know, they who live in the sea and they'll come up and graze. And sometimes you can get them to mate with your own cattle, and they're said to be very good cattle. But they'll go back into the sea uh, again. Um, there's uh, uh, something called the water horse, which is um, like a pretty much like a horse in most aspects, but its its mane grows the wrong way and its hooves are the wrong way round, and then uh, and that lives in bodies of water as well. And if it, you can ride it, but if you're not careful, it'll you know get out of control and go back into the water with you on it, and you'll never be seen again. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's um, I. I have seen it. I can't remember them all now, but Iceland is rich in terms of uh, tales of supernatural beings, yeah, and unusual yeah. beings, it, yeah. It isn't uh, modern day Iceland, despite uh, I think it's largely a Christian nation. Uh, isn't the belief in the elves still persistent within their culture? To some extent, there, there was a survey done. A while ago, um, I think it was worded badly, but I think people, what they were trying to say was, well, I'm not sure whether I believe in elves, but I wouldn't absolutely deny their existence. I wouldn't categorically deny their existence. Uh, and there have been, well, I mean, it's, they still have to go through uh, stages of planning when they want to put a new road down and if if someone says 
that the uh, the planned line of the road would go through a, a, a landscape feature which has been said since time immemorial to be a, a, a home of the elves, of the, of the hidden folk, uh, this actually has to be taken into consideration. And, and roads have been diverted. The, you know, there's a famous one near Reykjavik where the road splits in two and goes round a big rock rather than just through the rock or re- removing the rock altogether. Um, they... There is enough credence uh, to to make this happen, uh, and uh, people don't like it. And 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 there are tales of construction project uh, projects where um, they've gone ahead anyway and uh, upset the elves, and all kinds of bad things happen. That there are landslips, and machinery won't start, and um, people fall ill that get injured. Uh, and it's, it's said to be the elves taking their revenge. That gives uh, credence to the response. They don't necessarily believe in the elves, but they're not going to take any chances. Yes, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, I mean, my you know my friend um, in in Holmovik. He said as we were driving up to Holmovik the very first time, and. Um, he said to me, that hillside to our left there, they say that uh, elves live there. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. He said, uh, I never saw any yet, yet. Like, yeah, I was interested, intrigued by that because he, he was obviously, you know, keeping the option open that uh, he, he might see them. And then he goes and plants a lot of trees. It's one of his... Um, one of the things he does to try and improve the the local landscape, because he, I said, why do you do this? He said, because Iceland is very, very windy, and it will help to hold the not only help to hold the soil together, but they'll act as a windbreak. And um, so he's mainly planting fir trees. And uh, I was in his kitchen one afternoon at the end of the afternoon talking to his wife. And he came in, took his boots off, came into the kitchen, and he said to me, Wednesday, I talked to an elf wife today. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, what did she say? He said, well, he said, I was planting trees, and I was going to put one in front of a big rock. And the elf wife said to me, oh, please don't put it there because you'll spoil my view of the sea. And so he said, where would you like me to put it then? And she said, well, one either side would be really nice, as long as I can still see the sea. So he did. He put it one to either side uh, of of the rock, and he still goes and visits that rock sometimes. Yeah, so some people really do believe in them. You know, some people might be skeptical, but some people really do. Yeah. Oh, well, that's. Uh, I think I err on the side of I, I'm going to go ahead and believe they're there. I, I lean more towards an animistic worldview, and mm-hmm. it just makes the world more alive and richer. Uh, did your friend describe the elf bride? Or did he say he visually saw her or just heard her? No, um, he, he just heard her. It's just as as a voice in his head. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't actually uh, see her. Yeah. That, yeah. That's very interesting. Have, now, yeah. have you yourself had any uh, uh, personal uh, paranormal encounters or ghostly experiences or anything of the sort? I didn't have any while I was in Iceland, unfortunately. I, I kept hoping that I, I might want to might come across something, but uh, I didn't then. Uh, when I was younger, when I was a, a student at university, there, there was an encounter I'd uh, been round uh, with a friend of mine in his room, and uh, I'm pretty sure I wasn't drunk because I, we'd just had one pint of his home brew, which, you know, although it was powerful stuff, it, it takes a lot more than, than that to get me drunk. And um, I was walking back around midnight to my own room down a, a darkened corridor. It just had the night lights on, 
Uh, so it was it was dim. And the funny thing was, this, my state of mind was um, just in neutral. Uh, I really wasn't thinking about anything. To my left were the uh, student rooms, the doors of the student rooms, and to the right were the utility areas, the kitchen and the showers and so forth. And uh, the door to a kitchen was open, uh, and so it was dark inside, but in that darkness in the doorway, there was a a patch of darkness which was even darker. It was absolutely black, and it was moving. It was sort of pulsating. And as I looked at it, I thought, hello, I don't like the look of that. Um, well, what do I do? And have you ever walked down a road where um, somebody's left the gate open and there's a dog in the yard and you're not quite sure of the dog, you don't know it? Uh, you know, it, it, I find the key in such a situation is you, if you show fear, the dog will smell it immediately and think, hey, you've got a guilty conscience, you're not supposed to be here and it will get nasty. But if you pull your shoulders back and whistle and and act as if you've got every right to be there, um, it'll leave you alone. Well, this is this is what I did with this being that I had to pass to get down the corridor. And um, as I walked by it, I felt it reach out and touch me and on my arm and I got a sense of its intelligence which was or character which was something between a dog and a monkey you know it would have the curiosity of a dog it was sniffing at me and it had the the mischief of a monkey and it it would have dearly have loved me to run because then it could have chased me but I didn't I just walked on and of course I was seeing with my inner eye and with the inner eye, there's no limit. I could see behind me as well. Um, and I looked back, as it were, without turning my head. And it was it was hopping, bouncing down the corridor after me. And uh, I got out into the hallway, which was much, bright, much more brightly lit, and stopped at the bottom of the stairs and looked back towards the corridor. And this shadow halfway came out of the corridor and then sank back into it again. It seemed it didn't like the light and it wasn't going to pursue me any further. So I went upstairs to my room with a <laughs> increasingly quickly as I moved out of one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two <laughs> up to my room. And then it was only there when I got into my room and all the hairs on my neck went up and I, silly me, I went and turned the key and locked the door as if that would have made any difference. And, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that was yeah. I, um, I I that was my most significant encounter with uh, um, an entity, um, you know, unbidden. As I say, you know, it just came to me. I've um, uh, had other experiences with um, with other entities of uh, of, of gods and. Um, uh, other supernatural beings through through magic, but that's that's by that's by appointment and arrangement, and it, that's you know that's not me <laughs> that's not meant to be frightening, uh, or you know well it can be exhilaratingly frightening, but and that's the whole point of it. But you, yeah, you, it's under control. Um, I, I've, I've seen other things in the woods, you know, um, especially when I was going through the. Uh, a certain phase in in the golden dawn and um where i was meditating very hard on earth and i was seeing sort of earthly kind of um elementals in the woods a great deal oh yes and uh, and i um i saw something like a kobold manifested itself in the room uh at one point um you get used to it after a bit <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> Get used to these things. And I talk to trees. Well, shouldn't we all talk to trees? Well, yes. I mean, the, the, it's, the good thing is you get answers after a bit and they talk back. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that, well, was, Chris, um, that, uh, that was the most um, significant thing. Yes. 
Oh, excellent. Uh, th- thank you again for sharing that story. I, I, I'm not sure that I, I would have been all that fond of a sudden appearance of a shadowy creature in my hallway either, uh, <laughs> especially at a young age. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what sort of advice would you give to your younger self, uh, say your 20 something, early thirties, somewhere in that area, if you could go back and take your pursuit of the magical practices all over again? Well, bearing in mind that, um, the rune guild had already been in existence, um, you know, for quite a long time before I joined it. I, and I knew about it, but I can't remember why, for some reason I decided not to join it. I would tell my younger self to get in there and, um, uh, and get in there as soon as possible because it, I, I think it really is an excellent guild and, um, and it's, uh, teacher teaching and the structure of its teaching and the encouragement to do one's own research and uh, self-development is is very good indeed uh so that would have been one thing i'd have told myself um the other thing i would tell myself as a as a young man would be to um uh if i knew what i knew now is is stick even more at the learning of foreign languages especially icelandic i mean i I could have gone to Iceland in the 70s when it was much less developed still than it is now and um uh and, and gone there to to learn Icelandic uh, and I would have I wish I'd studied folklore at university instead of politics which is what I did um and and stuck at it so I would that's another thing I would tell myself but other other than that um I've no regrets, you know, you, you do what's all, you always do what seems best at the time. So there's no point in regretting anything, you know, whatever decision you make is the best decision you can make at the time. Nobody makes a stupid decision deliberately, um, or a neglectful decision deliberately. Uh, you always do what you think is best. So no regrets. Um, I'm happy that I'm doing it now. And, um, uh, you know, and still continue to be active in it. Well, thank you again for sharing your thoughts. And uh, we're coming now towards the end. And uh, I would like to extend my gratitude for you sharing your time with me and with my listeners. Uh, I know I've learned a lot more and I certainly hope that we've piqued the interest of many people out there to explore the realm of Icelandic and, and, magic specifically and Germanic magic in general. Uh, do you have any parting thoughts? Parting thoughts? Um, sure. Something I haven't covered or some uh, something that you'd like to address, some bit of insight you'd like to share. Well, I would obviously like everybody to go out and buy a copy of my book, Icelandic Magic, Aims, Tools and Techniques of the Icelandic Sorcerers by Christopher Allen Smith. And also buy copies for all their friends as birthday presents and Yule presents. And um, that would be very good. And also to look out for my next book, which I'm starting to research and write. Um I'm not quite sure what form it will take yet, but I think I'll probably uh, go more into the practical side of it than I did in my first book. Uh, Other than that, if you are uh, interested in Germanic magic and you're dedicated enough and uh, found worthy by the mastery to get get someone to take you on as an apprentice, then you can't do worse than join the Rune Guild. Um, it's it, it really is an excellent institution. That's all I would really like to say. I will second that. I agree. Everyone, go out and buy Christopher's book. Available in fine bookstores everywhere. And if they're not, I'm sure you could request it. Uh, I'm uh, sure also available on Amazon yes. and other online retailers as well. Uh, is there? Oh. oh one more thing. I must second the, the idea that, yes, the Rune Guild is an incredible institution. I've benefited greatly myself as being a part of it and apprentice to a master in the guild. 
And if you are seeking the Germanic mysteries, uh, there is no finer place for you to be. Now, Chris, where can people find you if they'd like to get more information? Do you have a website or any preferred contact and email address? Uh, you can find me uh, at um, on, on Facebook. I have a page there uh, with uh, the name of the book, Icelandic Magic. Uh, you can find me there and contact me there. Um, you can also... Um, you know, put in a friend request if you if you like Christopher Wednesday Smith, but obviously, um, don't be disappointed if I uh, decide I, I don't want to be friends at this particular point in time. You know, that's nothing personal. I just uh, just uh, I, I may not want to for various reasons. Um, and uh, if you wish to contact me, uh, you can write to Uncle underscore Wednesday at yahoo.co.uk. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, again, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time and your wisdom, your insights, and uh, especially thank you for the uh, the band name idea of Corpse Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to come, hasn't it? It's got to come. <laughs> It's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everyone out there, thank you as always for listening to Weird Web Radio. If you are on Facebook or Twitter, you can find us on Facebook under Weird Web Radio. We're on Twitter at Weird Web Radio. Find us on iTunes and all your favorite podcast apps. Give us the stars. Give us the likes. Make comments. Leave reviews. Good or bad. Either way, it helps people find us in their search engines. So once again, thank you for tuning in to Weird Web Radio. And everyone out there, stay weird. <laughs>